Good morning, peeps. Let's start this chapter six. Here we go. So it says use the graph of f of x. Here it is. Mm, beautiful. And then we're going to be graphing capital F of x here, starting with f of zero is zero. And over here, f of zero is one. I know. Let the good times roll. So first thing I want to do is looking at a couple points here. Let's break this into one half. There we go. So I'm going to write an integral from 0 to 1 half of f of x dx. I know by fundamental theorem that that will be f of 1 half minus f of 0. So since the graph tells me that that is going to be 0, that's delightful. We're going to go right here. This is going to be 1 half times 1 half times a height of 1, and voila, f of 1 half is 1 fourth, because adding over 0 was pretty darn easy. All right, going up to 1 here, we'll go 0 to 1. Could I have gone 1 half to 1? You betcha. Fundamental theorem says that is f of 1 minus f of 0. So the area now is 1 half times 1 times 2. Base of 1, height of 2. f of 1 is the big question, minus f of 0 we know to be 0. So the 2's cancel out. This is 1, and I have f of 1. Alrighty, let's start to make this happen. Got a nice little axis here. I'm going to go the same amount out. One, two, three, four. There's one. And there's two. So we start with our first point of zero, zero, which we knew one half. 1 fourth, 1, 1. Now the next thing that we have to take into consideration, this is the derivative graph. The derivative graph is increasing. If I take the slope of this section, this is a positive slope. That would be the second derivative. If the second derivative is positive, I know the original is concave up. All right, so let's do integral from 1 to 2 now. All right, 1 to 2. It's basically the same area I just found, just has a different factor. So we know that the area from 1 to 2 is 1. If f of 2 is the question, f of 1 is 1. So to solve for f of 2, f of 2 is 2. So do, 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 2. Oh, that's exciting. Now, the fact that we have to deal with here, this section is decreasing. This is the derivative graph. If I take the slope of this derivative graph, the second derivative will be negative. Therefore, this half concave down. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. So, now let's do the number two. I know. Don't let the excitement kill you. So, change here, f of zero is now one. So, when I do my work here again, if I go one, zero to one of f of x dx, it still looks like this. Fundamental theorem, f of b minus f of a, that should be reciting in your brain. Place the one there. Now going back to my work, I learned that this area was 1. So now f of 1 is adding the 1 over 2. All right, moving on from there, if I go 1 to 2 of f of x dx, that's the fundamental theorem, says f of 2 minus f of 1. f of 1 is now 2 f of 2 is in question. Again, the area of this section, height of 2, base of 1, 1 half, 
that's still going to be a lovely area of 1, so adding over the 2, f of 2 is now 3. So when I plot these points, do, 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 do. I'm going to have to affect my window here. It's going to get wild and crazy. 1, 2, so I'm going to go like this now. I'm going to go 1, 2, 3. That'll work. So f of 0, 1. f of 1, 2. f of 2, 3. Same rules apply. From 0 to 1, increasing function on the derivative. Therefore, when I take the derivative of the derivative, that would be the second derivative, that is concave up. Du -du -du. This section decreasing, take the derivative, would give me a negative number. Second derivative, concave down. Woo! That's beautiful. All right, wow, here's another one. Look at this. This section, steady velocity, and then slows down. So we can just do a couple here. Do, 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 zero to one. F of x, dx. Fundamental theorem says f of b minus f of a, top minus bottom. So one by one is an area of one. F of one is always the question mark. F of zero is zero. So f of one is one. Let's go one to two. I know this is going to be shocking information. f of 2 minus f of 1. f of 1 we recently learned was 1. f of 2. And that area is also 1. Base of 1, height of 1. Shocking! f of 2 we then find out is 2. So I come over here and I do a little graphy graph graph. 1, 2, three, four. One, two, three, four. So point zero, zero, one, one. Up here we were worried about concavity, blah, blah, blah. Here in this section I do not have to because it is a constant speed. It is gonna move with the straight line. Okay, f of two, we got it's two, f of three, so doing the last one here, three to four is just slightly more stressful. Integral three to four of f of x dx. The fundamental theorem part is not. f of four minus f of three. So f of three is three. f of four is one half times one and plus one half times one half times one, so one fourth plus a half, so three fourths. So three gets added over three plus three fourths. You can just write the mixed number. Do, 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 right there. And because this section is decreasing, it is concave down. I would like you to try this one right there. It will be glorious as you work through it. Notice how this graph changed from this graph, where you would say it went. Same thing is going to happen here, that it's going to keep the same value. What I want you to do for C is you're going to use f of 2 is 3. And pause the video and then get to that excitement because what is coming oh super excitement super excitement so now I'm sure you have completed the U tries you have full understanding of how to graph those and we come here to 6 2 <gasps> constructing antiderivatives I'm so excited for you I'm so excited so it says suppose f of x equals 0 what functions has this as a derivative? So here we go, thinking through. What did I take the derivative of that gave me zero? The answer, here we go. You could have had two. You could have taken the derivative of three. It could have been something crazy. 
like taking the derivative of, I don't know, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There we go. The derivative of that would be 0. And let's just talk about it. f of x, let's say I had pi. The derivative of pi, because pi as a number is 0. So what you're looking for here is that if you have an answer of 0, the original form was some constant. We'll talk about this. It'll be exciting. All right, next up. Suppose f of x equals k. k is also a constant because it sounds like, see, I don't ask. But in a lot of textbooks, you will see k is also considered a constant. What functions could have had a derivative constant? Now let's pick a constant to make you feel better. Let's say k is 4. So original functions could have been 4x. But here's where it gets fancy. It could have also been 4x plus 2. 4x minus 2. All of those taking the derivative would have given me the answer 4. So when you end up with your k there, you want to say that the general form of an antiderivative there is going to be kx plus that c. All right, if we're looking here now, we're ending with x. I've taken the derivative of something. The answer was x. Thinking about what happened there. So you can see hints coming down here of power rule, okay? That if I had x, that means what the original was when I was taking derivatives was x squared, right? But now, go another layer. If I take the derivative of x squared, I will not get x. I will get 2x, right? Of course, of course you're saying right. I know I can hear you all nodding. So we have to divide that by 2. That allows me to say, if I take the derivative of this, I will get that answer. Because we are now going to go backwards and say, here is the derivative. What was the original? Well, there we go. There's one example of what the derivative was. And based on the rules we've already pulled together, we're going to go and say, OK, it could have been 1 half x squared plus 2. 1 half x squared plus 27 million. Whatever floats your boat, as long as it's the right answer. So first, we will say, all right, if you are taking the antiderivative of x, you will say, 1 half x squared plus c. Go up the power, divide by it. So general rule here, if it was x cubed, we'd have to divide by a 3. So you're going to say that the general rule is x to the n plus 1 over that n plus 1, that dividing out when you would have done the power rule, and that constant c. C is going to make your life a little stressful in the future, but I feel you will make it through. Okay, here we go. We are now going to find the antiderivative. Get excited. Do it. It'll be excited. So, capital G of X. This is a fourth power, okay? To end up with that, I have to be up a power. So X to the fifth. I can't just throw out the 2, so the 2 goes back. When I then look at this, if I brought this 5 down, I would have 10. 10 is not what that says. So you need to compensate and divide by the power. Any constant, same thing is going up a power, so 3x plus c. Okay, try to pause, try, do it. Do it, do it. Good, I'm sure you've done it. So now you say to yourself, self, what are we doing here? Okay, I have to go up a power, 5x to the fourth. And you divide by four, and you add the c. The c is going to be your best friend. Here we go, here we go. Boop, 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 boop. Let's be fancy. Okay, here we go. 
go up a power, antiderivative, going back of all the work we've done here. 6x to the fourth over 4 plus 5, go up a power, 5 over the 5 minus x squared over 2. Finished? You should be yelling no at me. We need to always remember that there was a constant there. Okay. Fabulous. Here we go. More fun stuff. I know you're like, this is the best day ever. Thanks for these notes. Your answer was 1 over x. So I need you to recall, what did we take the derivative of in the fall that the answer was 1 over x? Now, that means my antiderivative is going to be the natural log of x. Now, because the natural log is unique in where it works, you want to make sure that you have the absolute value bars there. That restricts your domain and makes it work. If those absolute value bars are not there, when you take the antiderivative of 1 over x, you are not hitting the correct values. And of course, plus c. Okay, oh, look at the e. I know you people are so sad. Here we go. Remember, e to the x is e to the x. It was one of the best things in our lives that e to the x was e to the x. And if there's a constant in front of it, we learn from product rule that just stays. So the antiderivative is exactly the same as the original, which was nice because the derivative was exactly the same as the original. Do you see the pattern? I hope so. All right. Trig functions. If the answer when you took a derivative was sine, it means you started with negative cosine. Plus c. <gasps> Silly me, I did not put plus c up here. I know you were screaming at the screen. I know, I know. Okay, if the answer was cos when I took a derivative, the answer when I take an antiderivative means I started with sine x. And they're gonna ask secant squared because that connects to tan. Okay, if you've zoned me out, which is not like the best idea in life anyways, you want to make sure you tune back in right now. We have f of x and g of x are both antiderivatives. Then we find them. They're going to differ by that constant. And that is okay. We could have multiple options. Both of these could go through, let's say we had both have an antiderivative of 4. There could be 4x plus 5. There could be 4x plus 2. All of those are okay as long as you have that c. So you want to remember you are always going to have f of x equals the g of x plus a c. Vertical shifts. Vertical shifts. Next life problem. Difference between an antiderivative means just one example of it. The the and C happen to sound like they should go together. The and C, okay? When you have an, you're okay with it. When you have the, you must have C. All right, so we practice now. Here we go. I'm excited. You're excited. Find the antiderivative of each of them. Apply the derivative rules. It's going to be amazing. Ready? I didn't teach you a product rule yet, so what did we do before we had product rule in the fall? You have to do it through. So this will be t squared over t to the fifth minus t squared. Simplifying that, that will be t to the negative three minus t squared. Now the antiderivative, go up a power. t to the negative two divided by negative two. Yes, negative three plus one is negative two. Here t cubed over 3 plus c. Wonderful. Okay, next one, ewe. Make that z to the 1 half. This is special, right? Because you'd go up to z to the negative 1, adding 1 would be 0. It'd be disgusting. No, it's a special rule. Then we have a trig, then we have an exponential. I look forward to all of these. So z to the 1 half means z to the 3 over 2 divided by 3 over 2. I think it's better to multiply by 2 thirds. Now, when you see the 1 over z, you might start going, ooh, negative exponent, blah, 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 blah. No, 
okay? One over means that is the natural log. If you don't have those absolute value bars, it's all for naught. Okay, negative sign is the answer from when I took a derivative, which means we had cos as the original. And then lastly, e to the x is e to the x. The constant hangs on as a clinger. And the c. The c is your best friend in life. Oh, there's more to do. All right, you try. Do them. Do them. Do them. All right, definite integrals, indefinite integrals. Definite integrals is when you have bounds. And you will use FTC. Indefinite integrals, no bounds, and you will have a plus C as your answer there. Okay, so find the indefinite integral. Here we go. Up a power, 6T squared over 2 plus 2 t over 1, technically. You don't have to write that. Plus c. So making it pretty. I just simplified. Number 2. x cubed would become x to the fourth over 4 minus x squared over 2 plus c. This is your row. Now you might be going, oh, she's not giving me the answers. Yes, I'm not. I gave you an expensive calculator that does it for you. You can check on there, but remember, these questions are going to show up in the non-calculator section. So while you're practicing, feel free to have the magic toy. You need to know how to make it happen. All right, we're getting there. Definite integrals, here we go. So first, you have no quotient rule. You have nothing, you have a new power rule, that's it. Rewrite it as two separate fractions, one to two, one over y plus y squared over y. All right, antiderivative of one over y is natural log inside the absolute values. This simplifies to y, so that's much easier. So then the antiderivative of that is y squared over two. Now. Definite integral means I put on the bounds. So you write out natural log of 2 plus 2 squared over 2 minus, open a parentheses, natural log of 1, be careful, so it looks like a lot of bars in there, plus 1 squared over 2. That's a negative, let's just make it really thick. All right, so natural log of two minus natural log of one. Remember, log rules, subtraction of logs is division of logs. And this is two minus a half, so you can see it's four over two right now. Let's have three over two, subtracting the one. Okay, one more you try for you. You're going to go through, oh, I forgot that one. Okay, antiderivative of sine. What is it? What is it? What is it? Do you remember? I feel you should be able to answer me through this thing. Put your bar. Okay. We start with negative cos of 0 is going to give me negative 1. And then pi over 4. So cos, we'll have 1 over radical 2, negative 1 over radical 2. So negative 1 over radical 2 plus 1. That's fun. All right, I think we're almost done. Yes, we're almost done. So lastly, we have to think about the chain rule was so much of an importance in the beginning of the year, it's still gonna be there. So as I look at this, 
I have e to the 2x. It's no longer just e to the x. So when I write this, I'm going to say e to the 2x, just like I always did. If I was going to take the derivative, e to the 2x would be e to the 2x times 2, right? So we have to compensate for that 2, okay, plus c. Here we go. Antiderivative of side is negative cos of 3x. If I took the derivative of negative cos of 3x, I would get side 3x times 3. So you have to divide by that 3. Okay. Split this off. Notice I left this one with just 1 over x. I need you to remember that that is the natural log. I'm leaving that to you. No, it has the 1 half in front, so what would you multiply? Over here, this one looks kooky. Who's 1 over cos squared? Oh, yes. That's the tan. So you'll say 3 tan of 2x. Divide that by 2. So remember, this one's done, this one you're still going, these you are still going, and you've made it 26 minutes. I know you will tell me all about it, but I think you can do it. Have a great night, and I'll see you soon.